Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm Robert Bergholzer. I'm from the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality. I'm a scientist. Um, my office is responsible for um, surface and groundwater supply permitting and planning for the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, <clears throat> we call the, the system that we do this with VA Hydro for Virginia Hydro. Um, and it's a set of really adaptive data management tools and models that facilitate adaptive management of in-stream flows. Um, I'm gonna talk a lot about models today um, and VA Hydro as a you know, system. It's, you know, and, and it's, it's, as, it's as much of a um, method of approaching data management as it is an analytical system. So it's somewhat unique in that. Um, but the first thing I'll say is, um, why are we, why are we modeling? Um, our motivation in Virginia, we, we actually run models, um, which is kind of atypical. Most uh, places contract models, whereas we, we actually produce them and, and analyze themselves. Our motivation is one, to make science-based decisions. And in, in order to do that, we have to, you know, we want to minimize unintended consequences. We want to be an honest broker, so we want to make sure that the right questions are being asked and that all of the questions that need to be asked are being asked. Uh, and that way, we think that we can ensure that the dialogue stays on track um, and that we also don't stray too far from our regulatory charge. If you've worked with contractors and, and applicants in the past where um, the applicants are pushing the modeling, then their question tend to get primacy and the questions of the resource agencies can somewhat be ignored. So we feel like modeling, taking that on, allows us to, to make sure that all the right questions are being asked. And again, we're, we're, we're tasked with protecting all beneficial uses. That means off-stream water users, but we're also tasked with in-stream resources like fish. We're tasked with maintaining recreational flows as well. Um, and in our our statute, none are higher or are placed above any other. Although generally speaking during crisis, obviously human water supply gets, a, gets, gets the nod. What we need is we need to ask the answerable questions. Um, and that is a very crucial priority that we have. We want to have editable living models. So we don't want a model to be produced by someone and then to have it sit on the shelf. The model needs to be able to be run and modified and to evolve. We need model users, uh, that is people in our office that can use models and apply them. And uh, we need, in order to do that, we need a consistent and flexible data model. And that's gonna be a really, really critical piece that I'll hopefully not go into too much detail on, um, but it is important to us and it facilitates everything that we do. Um, I, I, and again, I don't, I, I can't believe, I can't emphasize it enough, but I'll try not to belabor it too much today and I'll try to get to the nice stuff. One other process that we, we engage in is developing metrics to describe all the beneficial uses or all the interests of all the stakeholders. That's a critical piece when you're managing large scale systems like all the water resources in the Commonwealth, there are thousands of water users uh, you know, individual facilities that withdraw water, water, millions of citizens, all of them that we, we want to try to make sure that we can have metrics that determine whether or not their needs or concerns are being represented. We also need remote data access. So in order to do our job properly, we need to integrate the work of scientists and regulators. And so you need remote data access in your system in order to do that. What we don't need generally, and perhaps surprisingly, is desktop GIS. Um, for the most part, desktop GIS is good for one-off analyses and for preparing data to go into a system. But once you have a mature analytical system like we do, we find that the desktop GIS is very seldom used now. Um, we often don't need a shinier model. It does need to be adaptable, um, but we need to be certain that we know how to ask good questions with the modeling tools that we have. And then 
use the models that we have to answer those. We don't need more model developers than users. At least that's not our goal. Our goal is to have more model users than developers. So we want to avoid having single experts who tend to be single points of failure. And we don't need to answer every question now. Again, to number one, we really need to focus on the answerable. What does VA Hydro uh, look like? It's an integrated water management app. Um, our system provides online reporting for end users. That's withdrawal, monthly withdrawals for all substantial surface water and groundwater users within the Commonwealth. All well construction data is also entered through online portals by well drillers in the Commonwealth um, that are in the, the groundwater management areas. Um, that has geospatial information to describe all of these things, as well as the, the, the quantitative data that describes their use over time. The system also allows us to run models and run model scenarios and harvest the data from those models and store that data back in the system. That's crucial. We have a large water supply planning app that allows localities to enter their current and future demands. And, um, and those demands then feed into our water supply model simulations so that we can show things like biological response and cumulative impact from other users. Our system also manages changing land use over time as an input to our model decks. And we also manage a sophisticated reservoir action system so that we, we can track the subtleties of how re reservoirs behave in the context of their um, permits and the daily varying flows that they encounter. I won't go, go too deeply into this, but we, you know, data modeling. We believe that success is 90% organization and 10% inspiration. So a lot of our time and effort is spent making sure we have a good flexible data model and that we apply that data model effectively. You know, in other words, um, we, we answer a few questions. One, how easy is it to get data into and out of our system? That, that's, that's got to be the number one for your data model. Um, and second, are your data structures uh, are changes to data structure a non-starter? So that speaks to the flexibility. So, and how we apply it is for us, we need to provide a structure that helps us organize historical data. That's the monitoring piece and the reporting piece, and also compare those to the model indicators that are the outcome of our simulations. So here's an example of what it looks like. We have water use facilities. Um, those facilities withdraw water from the stream. Um, we track their data so we know what they're doing currently and we can plot their, their, their progress over time or their evolution of their demands over time. And we can use it to help the localities project their future conditions. That, that information then feeds directly into our model. As you can see here, we've got model scenarios and that we'll, you know, we use to compare. And so one of the things that we do routinely for water supply planning is to assess current conditions and then compare those current conditions to the projected conditions at some endpoint. Right now we're in a 20 year planning cycle. We're on the end of a 20 year planning cycle. We're getting ready to start over the next five years to do a 30 to 50 year planning cycle to project water use in the Commonwealth and the potential for uh, impacts to the in-stream and off-stream resources. So for example, in this one, this is a simple example, but we, we will calculate during a, during a simulation, what's the average withdrawal by a facility? What's their average discharge back to the stream? And then if they have any unmet demands due to restricted in-stream resources, and what's the 30-day maximum unmet demand? And that's a metric. Uh, and that's something that I will, I will talk about in each of the rest of these um, slides. Um, I'm gonna show some case studies. This is a, a, a detailed case study of the facility thing. So in this, the, the way we measure um, the facility is we, we have a metric of 30-day maximum unmet demand is one of the ones that we look at. Um, these are based on integrated operation and, and flow models. We have drought restrictions programmed into the models as well. So we can tell when changes to flows due to upstream users have resulted in consequences to downstream users, such as unmet demand. 
unmet demand doesn't necessarily mean running out of water. It can also mean needed for conservation. So they have to go into some sort of drought restrictions to achieve a certain reduction, or they may have to rely on off-stream storage, groundwater backup, or transfers from other systems in their region. Um, and then we provide metrics they know that come back. So like this heat map here is a grid that describes in every year of our simulation and every month of that simulation, what the unmet demands are or what the drought restrictions are that have been experienced by this facility in this simulation. These images are generated by um, analytical programs that run at the end of model simulations and that are pushed back to our VA hydro system. So any planner or permit writer can look at the model results and see these things that give a, which will give a quick indication of what's happening with the system. We have a second view where we look at a 40, 30 years down the road, um, what changes have happened to the river that might increase or decrease the number of unmet days of demand. In this case, we see about a 15% increase in the number of days in which this system has to be into drought restrictions as a function of upstream users increasing their demands. This is another case study um, which focused on an impoundment that had a fish passage uh, outlet port, which was below the, the normal surface pool level and which becomes interoperable when drawdown in the reservoir is below 4.5 feet. So we put 4.5 feet is our metric of interest here. And we use our models to analyze what's going to happen uh, to that fish passage given the demands that we are projecting and given the rules that govern the uh, uh, um, releases that this reservoir has to make. We then use that to try to optimize those releases. One of the things that we're challenged with in this is that climate isn't stationary. We have also been able to, using the system, integrate climate change models that look at um, how increased surface temperatures will result in increased evaporation and how that might impact stream flows. So we can see here that our models currently suggest that annual evaporation will increase on average over an inch. Um, it has increased over an inch in the last 30 years and is projected to continue to increase. And that that has in part led to a decrease in the 90 day low flow. That's the metric that we use to analyze um, severe drought in our streams is the 90 day lowest flow. Um, and we can see that the trend overall is for that to be decreasing as a result of that increased um, evaporation. Um, and then and we use that to try to develop strategies for drought forecasting to enable us to you know, come up with more appropriate droughts, drought response um, restrictions and reservoir operations. We also use this for integrating river habitat management. This is a situation where we have um, in-stream flows, habitat flow models, and we compare those habitat flow models. When we run a future or current scenario, we can see what response the habitat is going to have as a function of increased demands in the future. So we look at here and we say, well, during moderate drought conditions, uh, we see November and December have some fairly substantial decreases in habitat due to future water supply demand. During a more severe drought, we see that September through December have increased uh, habitat losses due to the future water supply demand. And during the most extreme droughts, we face those habitat losses during August, September, October, and November and December. This system has also now integrated our newest research on how flow depletion may, long-term flow depletion changes in average stream flow might uh, have the potential to decrease uh, biodiversity or, or, or you know, uh, species richness of, of fish. Um, our system tracks how those uh, changes in richness may vary by ecoregion and, and, and uh, by river basin and allows us to predict the potential species loss due to an increase in consumptive use in a given stream. And I would uh, now like to 
open up to questions.